What is courage? Is it taking the less easy path? Is it standing up for what you believe in or against what's unjust? Is it simply being brave? Well, the next three speakers that you're about to hear from, I'm sure wouldn't describe themselves as courageous. So I'll have to do it for them. Representing Finchurch Aid in South Sudan, in Ukraine, and in Syria, they've chosen the less easy path because of what they believe in. Now, I'm going to let Mazan and Patricia and Seme take you into their worlds in their own words, but I'm sure you're going to have questions and want to know a little bit more about them. So I invite you to use the QR codes on the leaflets that you have on your chairs or you've been given to ask questions through our online form, and we'll return to our speakers for a brief Q&A at the end of the presentation. Now, just like the beginning of this presentation, each speaker will be preceded by an audio track, a sound from their own country. And we start off with a sound that is unfortunately all too common for those who live and work in Ukraine. just heard is the sound of an air raid siren. <clears throat> For people across Ukraine, this is a sound that they hear regularly, sometimes many times a day. Just over a month ago, Russia bombed the city of Chernihiv in northern Ukraine. This was the first time Chernihiv had been bombed in almost nine months, so it was unexpected and without warning. A school that we had repaired previously was damaged again during this recent bombing. The school principal wrote to us the day after and told us what happened. She said, the alarm started shortly before 9 a.m. Not every alarm means that there will be a bombing, but as a precaution, when the alarm goes off, teachers and students are required to go into the school bomb shelter. So on this day, everyone went into the basement, and at 9 a.m., they stood for the daily moment of silence for those who have been killed because of the war. The principal said that as soon as they stood up, there were three very loud explosions nearby. All the teachers and children laid down on the floor. Teachers were telling the students it was okay not to be afraid because this was just the sound of Ukrainian air defense protecting them. In reality, at that moment, the teachers didn't know what was happening. And then people who had been walking by on the street started rushing into the shelter saying, this isn't just an alarm, there are real explosions nearby. Many students were upset and worried. Teachers did their best to comfort them and keep themselves calm while waiting to find out what was happening. Luckily, for that school on that day, there was only some minor damage to the building. But this is the type of situation Ukrainian students and teachers can be faced with on any given day. Ukraine's education system continues to function despite the war, but the way it functions is extremely complicated, and there are a lot of challenges and disruptions. One big issue is access to bomb shelters. Only schools with a functioning shelter are allowed to teach students in person. For most schools, this is their basement, which needs to be clean, warm, equipped with washrooms, desks, or just benches so teachers and students have a place to sit. Finchurch Aid has renovated and equipped 39 bomb shelters in schools since May 2022. If a school is modern, fully equipped, but does not have a shelter, it is not allowed to open. If a school has 200 students, but the shelter only has space for 100 students, then only 100 students are allowed at school at any time. In those cases, kids need to, kids needs to study in, in shifts, coming to school on alternate days, which means doing half their classes in person and the other half online. 
And in the areas of the country closest to the front, where the risk is highest, all schools are online only. We work with teachers and students in Kharkiv city, which is 30 kilometers from the border with Russia, and has been bombed almost daily since January. Kharkiv has been in the news recently because Russian troops are coming closer to the city. And the mayor has said that he believes Russia wants to turn the city into another Aleppo. In Kharkiv, the only schools that are allowed to open for in-person learning are five schools in the metro system and a new school that has built, been built completely underground. All other learning is online only. And this is for the fourth year in a row, after two years of COVID and now two years of war. In some places, usually poor rural communities, it's difficult for students to do their online classes because they don't have good internet access or devices. FCA and other organizations have opened digital learning centers in some of these communities where tablets and Wi-Fi are available and facilitators can help students access their online classes and deal with technology issues. When we talk about courage in Ukraine, we need to talk about Ukrainian teachers. Their jobs are incredibly complex right now. They are responsible for teaching their students, often both in person and online on the same day. And they need to provide psychological support to students during frightening situations like air raids. And also, they need to deal with the after effects of those types of events. They can be working with students who are worried about one of their parents who might be fighting at the front, could be a prisoner of war, or has been injured as a result of the war. To help teachers with all of these challenges, Finn Church Aid psychologists provide training on psychological first aid for those emergency situations, and they show teachers how to recognize the long-term effects of trauma or stress and help students deal with this. We also help teachers to take care of themselves with emotional well-being trainings. And this helps them deal with the demands that they are facing. <clears throat> I was asked to talk about courage, the courage it takes to work in a place like Ukraine. And to do that, I need to tell you about my Ukrainian colleagues. But let me tell you a few things about myself first. I'm a Canadian, yet I have a lot of personal ties to Ukraine. My grandparents immigrated from Ukraine, and I grew up in the Ukrainian-Canadian diaspora. When I started my career in international development, I managed projects in the country for four years, and I even adopted my two sons from Ukraine. So I have a strong personal interest in seeing Ukraine succeed, but I'm not sure that working there for someone like me can be seen as courageous in comparison to my Ukrainian colleagues. I've been working in Ukraine since October 2022, and I have seen that the war impacts everyone in the country in a variety of big and small ways every single day. Finchurch Aid Ukraine has a staff of 32 people, 27 of them are Ukrainians. Most of our staff worked in the private sector before the war, so working with a, an organization like Finchurch Aid is a completely new experience. And it's not just a job, but also a chance to help their country. I'd like to share a few exa examples of how our team's work and personal courage overlap. Our procurement officer, Mariana, that's her behind me, takes great pride in helping students get back to school. Whenever we visit a school, she asks us to send her pictures of the desks or the water coolers we've provided so she can see how the items she's bought are being used. And her interest isn't just professional. In 2022, when the war began, the community where she lives, outside of Kiev, was occupied and sustained a lot of damage. She fled with her children and lived with a family of strangers in Western Ukraine for six months until it was safe to come home. Our head psychologist, Lyudmila, who's on this side, has had to leave her home and relocate her family twice from two different cities in 10 years because of Russian aggression, first in 2014 and then again in 2022. Now she trains teachers and school psychologists on how to care for themselves and their students. Our finance director, Alex, was living in the UK when the war started and came back to Ukraine to work with us because he wanted to help his country. So why is this courageous? because men between the ages of 18 and 60 are not allowed to leave the country right now. So he is indefinitely separated from his wife and children who stayed in the UK. And one final example, 
our business development manager, Maria, has a young son, and they're part of a mommy and me group for mothers with young children that go meet together to play or to share information. A few months ago, one of the other mothers in her group and her three-year-old son were killed while they slept where, when their apartment building was hit by a drone. These are just a few of the stories of the many Ukrainians who have stayed since the war began. But I want to say that I also think that Ukrainians who have left the country because they've decided they want their children to have an uninterrupted education are also very brave. It takes a lot of courage to leave your home, your career, friends and family, and move to a new country to seek a safer environment for your children. I'd like to end by saying that, believe it or not, <laughs> some days life in Ukraine can seem fairly normal, but the situation can change very quickly, and no place in the country is safe. People continue to die every day because of the war, and everyone is living with a lot of uncertainty and worry because it's impossible to know what will happen next. War is a waste of everything. It's a waste of life, potential, and energy. And at the same time, what I've learned from watching how Ukrainians cope is that life goes on no matter what. For most people, the desire to move forward, to continue learning and contributing, is very strong. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon all. Um, what you have just heard are the voices of people who were trying to uh, help their relatives and loved ones uh, from under the rubble during the earthquake that hit Syria last year. And if anyone in this room has been through an earthquake event, you would exactly know the horrible feeling of it. And if the earthquake happened to occur during your sleep, then your fear would be double. The earthquake that hit Syria and Turkey last year in 2023 resulted in the death of thousands of people in Syria. Other millions were left homeless, without food, without water, without medical care. I was in Damascus when the earthquake struck at 20 past 4 a.m. in the morning. Although Aleppo and Latakia were the epic center of the earthquake, far from Damascus, I felt it strongly. I woke up confused, unaware what was happening. For the first few seconds, I thought I was dreaming. But then I jumped out of bed when I realized it was an earthquake. Following safety protocols, I took shelter under the nearest table in my apartment. I immediately contacted our security manager and together we conducted a head count to make sure all of our staff were safe. My initial concern was for the staff. At first, I was not aware of the earthquake magnitude until I received security alert from our manager and other contacts. And I understood later on that the magnitude was so high that it was felt throughout the region, including Jordan, where my family lives. In the aftermath of the earthquake, thousands of people remained in the street, fearing the return to their apartments. One thing that I noticed during the time of the earthquake is that people record, recalled their personal traumas 
of past events during the conflict and war. And this then made them feel again unsafe and threatened. I witnessed children exhibiting their trauma through continuous crying or screaming, even after the earthquake event had calmed down. In Syria, rescue work was absolutely burdened. The country lacked appropriate equipment and the train workers. Furthermore, medical care venues were already overwhelmed and lacked capacity to respond to the needs of the earthquake victims. As an active humanitarian actor in Syria, FCA was at the forefront of relief efforts. We were one of the leading organizations distributing relief items, non-food items to people in shelters. For example, we distributed blankets, heaters to keep people warm during the cold winter. We also distributed hygiene materials and women hygiene kits. We provided cash aid and other forms of support to impacted families. Through our relief efforts, we supported 4,000 families with different types of relief items. We also rehabilitated 80 earthquake impacted schools. We fixed walls, repaired broken windows and damaged doors to make sure that school is again a safe place to host children. Through our efforts, we enabled thousands of children to return to school and find support and healing. One of the things that I learned from the difficult time of the earthquake, that Syrian people are incredibly resilient. I witnessed our employees, for example, volunteering to help others, gather material and participate in community initiatives. All of these were beyond their work requirements. Their dedication provided a, a true example that pain can either break us or bring out the best in us, the willingness to help others and reduce their pain and suffering. Overall, our work began in Syria back in 2018. It started with two recruited employees working only in two governorates. Today, we work through a growing team of 40 staff members with 45 other volunteers covering eight governorates, including Damascus, Aleppo, Raqqa, Homs, Hama, Idlib, Tartus, and Latakia. So far, and through support from different donors, including the Finnish government, we have been able to rehabilitate 132 schools, enabling around 85,000 children who were out of school or at high risk of dropping, dropping out to commit to formal education path again. Our rehabilitated schools are gender and disability inclusive venues and they are friendly and safe environment for all. We have also trained more than 1,200 teachers on different educational topics and provided psychological and trauma healing support to different children. On personal level, I am married with two children. My family lives in Jordan, I'm Jordanian. While I travel back and forth frequently between Syria and Jordan, I typically stay in Syria for one month and a half to two months. Then I travel back to Jordan to stay with the family for one week to 10 days. Family is absolutely the top priority in my life. However, I also love my work and I find it uncomfortable to leave the team in Syria for a prolonged time period. Of course, my family worries whenever there is a security incident happens in the country. However, I always explain to them, I am not working alone. I am a member of a well-founded organization. We have concrete security protocols, a dedicated security team, and close coordination with UN security mechanism and other 
security protocols. The human aspect of my work goes beyond providing aid to beneficiaries. It is also about my colleagues, our employees, and the interaction, interactions with them, the stories of their lives that also matter to me and to the management team. In Syria, staff well-being is at the heart of our work. We believe a motivated and engaged team is a key to performance. When team members are motivated, this will positively impact the morale and motivation of the entire management team, and including myself. While our team travels daily to project areas, their safety and security remain a daily concern for me. Although the security situation has improved overall, random incidents can still happen. In fact, it is easier for me to manage the worry and concern of my family than to manage my fear about the safety and security and well-being of our staff. Our commitment to staff well-being goes beyond physical safety to include mental and psychological health. Despite our efforts, the Syrian people are deeply affected by significant challenges facing the country. The prolonged Syrian conflict has diminished hope for good future, in particular for youth. Even amidst these difficulties, our employees strive to stay strong, positive, and continue providing support to their communities and their beloved ones. That, to me, is courage. I want to end here and to thank you all for your attention and presence. Thank you. Yes, courage. We are here to speak about courage. The sound you have heard is the sound of courageous kids in one of the conflict-affected areas in South Sudan called the Fangak, extremely remote. These kids wake up every morning, often walking kilometers to be able to get to school. Most of the times on empty stomachs are not even sure if they'll be able to return home again because they cannot be sure when the next fighting breaks out. So when you speak about courage today, I want to share my own personal story about courage which starts at school. I was born in the middle of the Second Sudanese Civil War. And one afternoon in 1993, the month is April. The time is 11 a.m. We were in school, I was attending classes. When an air raid happened, that will forever rewrite my life. An Antinob airplane belonging to the Sudanese Armed Forces conducted an air raid in what was by then considered a rebel territory. Unfortunately for us, the air raid dropped a bomb in the middle of our school. The bomb submerged half of the school. The entire half of my kids, the teachers whom I know in school, were all gone. What was left in the school were the dust, the screams of children who were injured. There was blood all over. Literally, there was darkness that was left in our once beautiful school. The green leaves from the trees in our compounds that once beautified the compound 
all turned dry and literally the compound vanished. We were helpless. As a seven-year-old child, I was confused. We were angry on why an innocent school would be targeted by the armed forces. We were destitute. From that day for the next six months, I didn't see my parents. And I had no idea on what had become of or had happened to them. Today, 31 years later, as I remember this day, and every time someone speaks about war, it reminds me of this tragic day that forever I'll always remember. It's painful, it's courage, but it takes courage for us to get up and be the difference that the world demands in situations like this. Few of us who survived this horror walked for days until we reached refugee settlements across the border in the neighboring Kenya and Uganda. From then on, I spent 15 years of my life, from the time I was seven years old, moving from one refugee settlement to another in search of education. Luckily for me, I continued studying through scholarships, generously supported by people from across the world. When you speak about war, it's a different story for everyone. For me, war robbed me of the opportunity to enjoy the love of my parents. War and the violence made me experience what it means to lack nothing and what it means to lack everything. What it means to be a refugee. What it means to survive. And what it means to be an innocent child brutally deprived of the love of his or her parents. Every day my wish is to see no child experience the same in their lives. My courage to continue what I do is because I want to see the difference. The difference where children are free to take what they want. My resolve to survive and to thrive against all odds from that time defined the foundation of my courage. Unfortunately, when you speak about this, for South Sudan, it's not history. This is still the daily reality of 70% of the population of South Sudanese who face war, drought, starvation, and often violence every day of their lives. This, for me, does not scare me, unfortunately, but pushes me to work harder to work better, and I remind myself every day that I am not safe until everyone around me is safe. That I cannot be at peace until all my neighbors are at peace. Courage often is what is left, especially when you're the only source of hope for everyone around you. Briefly about South Sudan, South Sudan became an independent country in 2011. After two years, I mean two decades of the brutal Sudanese civil war, which is saw over two million people killed. About 2.5 million people, including myself by then, who were forced to seek refuge across the neighboring countries. And the four million people displaced internally. Two years after South Sudan became independent in 2011, civil war broke out in 2013 and 2016. This added to the persistent violence driven by lack of economic opportunities, greed, and the political contestations have unfortunately undermined the post-independence hopes and development gains, and intensified the existing humanitarian needs. To date, South Sudan remains impacted by fragility, economic stagnation, and unending instability. The 2024 Humanitarian Response Plan indicates that 9 million South Sudanese will require humanitarian assistance, and that is literally 72% of the entire country's population. It also indicates that 7.1 million South Sudanese will require food assistance between April and July this year. And over 1,000 are living in conditions that are equivalent to that of famine. 
Other nutrition remains critical since we have over 1.4 million children who are considered malnourished. And women and the children continue, unfortunately, to be the most affected part of this population. In the 2023 Aid Worker Security Report, South Sudan was ranked the most dangerous country for aid workers. In 2023 alone, over 40 attacks on humanitarian workers were recorded. 22 humanitarian workers in South Sudan were killed. I could have been one of the 22 who were killed, but I'm here speaking to you. That to me is courage. The easiest choice would have been to run. The humanitarian crisis has been exacerbated further by the conflict in the Sudan, which has led to an inflow of refugees into South Sudan. As of April this year, over 680 Sudanese have entered South Sudan as refugees. When you walk in the streets of South Sudan, you see open trauma because of the decades of the brutal civil wars. South Sudan's vulnerability to climate change and the natural disasters further compounds the country's humanitarian crisis, further jeopardizing recovery and undermine development. Since its independence in 2011, the country has suffered recurrent severe droughts and floods which in mother makes the difficult situation more complicated. Why Finchi Church Aid in South Sudan? In 2010, FCA opened its office in South Sudan, but specifically in 2014, the organization opened a full country program office. And currently we have over 70 staff who are working for Finchi Church Aid in South Sudan. 94 of these 75 staff are South Sudanese, like myself, who have taken on courage to step to help the people of their country to endure the suffering, to build their resilience, but most importantly, to remain the source of hope. Our work is supported by hundreds of volunteers and more than 500 teachers. What keeps us going in the middle of these difficulties? The resilience and the courage of the ordinary people, of the children like those in Fangaku who wake up every morning to go to school despite hardships, often on empty stomachs, or even not sure whether they will ever be able to come back home again, pushes us as tough to do our best. Together with our local partners, and with the generous funding from the Finnish government through the Minister of Foreign Affairs, collections from churches here in Finland, we have been able to support the construction and rehabilitation of several schools over the last 10 years. We have trained hundreds of teachers. We have distributed thousands of agricultural inputs and we have supported the recovery and the healing of several people who are traumatized. That's contributing to the development of the national level policies. As I come to close speaking about courage, I want to encourage us to consistently demonstrate empathy towards people who are suffering, suffering which has been unnecessarily imposed on them by unnecessary wars. We don't have to experience war to understand how dangerous war is. We can be the hope the world needs. War is bad. War is dangerous, but war can be avoided if courageous people like you seated in this hall today choose to work for peace. It's not easy, but it's possible. Let us all be courageous. Thank you. Thank you, Seme. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Mazan. Now, as we set up for questions, I would invite you, if you would like to show your appreciation once more, now is the time to do it for our wonderful speakers.
Thank you. So hopefully my colleague Elisa has been taking your questions. So Elisa, do we have questions? And if so, what is the first one? Yes, we have. Does this work? <laughs> Um, so first one goes to Martin. Um, what is the access situation in Syria and how are you able to reach those in need? Yeah. <laughs> so um, Syria has different regions. Um, Part of the regions are controlled, uh, are under the control of the government of Syria, the current government. Uh, other parts are controlled uh, by other powers, for example, in the northeast and the northwest, uh, mainly US, Kurdish groups, and Turkey that are controlling. Uh, parts of the land. 80% uh, of the land is currently under control of the government of Syria. Uh, and we work in the 80% of the land. We don't work in the other areas. Um, we can reach out to any beneficiaries within, that, uh, within those lands, but we cannot cross the line to the other areas under different control. Uh, that is not allowed by the government to work in, in, in other areas. And it will be a risk for us because we, we don't know with whom we can coordinate to provide the aid to other people. So in the, the conclusion, we work only in government control area. And uh, we have reach to all beneficiaries on that uh, uh, area. Thank you, Marcin. Thank you. Um, then one quick question for Patricia. Uh, why is it important to rebuild schools, uh, even though they might be bombed tomorrow? Quick answer, please. Um, okay. The quick answer is not every part of Ukraine is the front line. In the country, there are all different parts of the, what we call in the business, humanitarian nexus represented. There are immediate, very extreme, life-saving humanitarian needs on the front lines. And the rest of the country is in a, in a, um, a variety of different situations. Some parts in reconstruction, some parts in complete normal activities and ready to move forward and move towards Europe. Um, Yes, it's true that it's possible some things can be damaged again, but the odds of everything being damaged again seem to be low. And despite that, um, without education as structure for communities, hope for the future, um, then we're just giving up on the country. Um, despite the war, Ukraine continues to move towards Europe and not just maintain, but advance and reform. Uh, we see it all the time in communities across the country. People are not interested in just staying as is. They want to move forward and they deserve the support to do that. Thank you. And maybe one quick for Seme also. Um, despite South Sudan being a very poor country with uh, most of the citizens being um, in need for humanitarian assistance. How do South Sudanese people find this will and courage, mainly will, to help, for example, Sudanese people fleeing over the, well, across the border to South Sudan at the moment? The people who are fighting and displacing people are not the ordinary people. And the ordinary people who are fleeing share the same suffering and the same challenge with the people who are literally receiving them. So when people who are struggling help themselves, they are not just exercising moral responsibility, but tomorrow it will, it will be you who will be displaced. And it's like, what happens to my brother happens to my sister. That is basically literally what happens. They just have to share the little they have because they know what it means to be assisted by another person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Elisa, and thank you, thank you all of our speakers for answering those questions that we received online, and thank you for, for posing them. We would like to finish with a short video that we think shows you what the heart of FCA is. Thank you very much. Patricia has to catch a plane, but there will be an opportunity to talk further with Semi and Mazan in the adjoining room. So all that remains is for me to thank our speakers for your dedication, for your passion, for the distance that you've traveled to be with us. But I also want to thank you guys for your rapt attention. This wasn't an easy subject. Thank you very much.